I remember for my christening, because my dad was on the Navy ships, they bought me a guitar. He taught me a few like basic chords on that guitar. I must have been about five or six. When I did the X Factor, I got to sing at Wembley. That was pretty cool. And there was like 10,000 people there or something wow. like that. Wicked. So, you've also got the pressure of these four people looking at you. There's also <laughs> 10,000 behind them. The first song, people clapped halfway through, and I remember I just stopped the performance. <laughs> so I was like, well, what is this? But we had one with us this Christmas party once, and this woman threw a bauble at me <laughs> off the Christmas tree, picked up, wow. threw the bauble at me. I was like, oh, I'm out of here. You just stopped. Yeah, I just you? left. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I, I'm not having that type thing. I've always wanted to play Madison Square Garden as well. Big dreams. Hello, welcome to One More Songcast. We're back with another guest, and it's the very popular Connor Banks. How are you doing, Connor? Yeah, I'm good, thank are you. Are we good? Much. Yeah, yeah good, good to have you on. Finally, thank good to meet much. you. Nice to meet you as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this is about our, what is it, our sixth guest episode of the season, something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. And our first episode of the season goes out today, um, which is, what is it, the 2nd of October? 1st of October? 2nd of October. Yeah, there we go. How have you been, Connor? How, have you been gigging plenty, I'm guessing? Yeah, I've been very busy. I've just had a holiday, so oh, yeah. Yeah, now back into it again. So. We yeah, full, fully booked to the end of the year. Wicked, so yeah, good really man. Good, yeah. Was it a musical holiday or just no, a break? No, just, just a chill holiday. We went to America, so oh, nice. just, it was very good. Do you find girlfriend. it tough getting back into it after a holiday? <laughs> I just miss it, you know, when I'm away. I'm like, oh. And then you see other musicians out <laughs> yeah. when I was... We, we went for a meal one night and there was a band on. I was like, oh, I missed that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was all right. I was tired on Saturday because, you know, you're not used to it. It's like yeah. it's like going to the gym, isn't it? It's, mm. If you're not all oh, two hours singing... And I got back into it, I was like, oh, that's all right now, yeah. but it should be all right for next week. <laughs> yeah, I always find your voice needs a bit of uh, adjusting when you get back into it. Even yeah. after a week, you're like, you feel it at the start, don't you? But I hated the way it sounded on Saturday. Yeah. I was like, yeah. oh, this is, don't feel all right. <laughs> it's strange. I think the best thing I did, I recently had a holiday and I got back the Saturday and gigged the Sunday. I think it was yeah, the best thing I could I did, have done. Yeah. I think it was the best thing I could have done because sometimes you leave it that extra week and it takes you about eight or nine songs yeah, as opposed yeah. to three or four to yeah. get into the gig yeah that's exactly what I did we got home on the Friday Saturday I was gigging straight away so wicked yeah it was wicked. good uh, funny story so I had a gig in Burnley on Saturday and I'm setting up the party started at two it was a private party and uh, I realised with about 10 minutes to go that I'd left my mixing desk at home. So, so, so I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm 25 minutes-ish away from home. So I had to get my girlfriend to meet me, you halfway, know, yeah. halfway. And it was just an absolute nightmare. But uh, thankfully, they were quite understanding. So but, yeah, don't leave your mixing desk at home. <laughs> I used to take two mixing desks with me as well. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll leave that one now. I'm never going to use it. I like the way you say understanding, like they've got a choice to be on the well, know, <laughs> It's either like, I oh, get me desk or no music yeah. what do you want <laughs> acapella <laughs> so uh, Connor we're going to start off with, with your sort of I mean I know you're quite young anyway but yeah. your early days of music so I believe you started singing at about 10 was it in yeah. Charlie Live and yeah. stuff like that yeah so I remember we because I lived down south originally right. my dad was in the navy so we lived in Portsmouth we moved back up here and then um, I remember there was Pen of them Live I think my dad was like, I'll just give it a go. It's only 45 minutes. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it again. So I did that for the first time. And then from then, it was pretty much just non-stop for Wicked, 11 yeah. years now. So nice. um, I remember that it was just that whole weekend. And then I did Friday, Friday Saturday, isn't it? Um, did that. And then Choi Live, Longton Live. Just kept doing that type of stuff. Charity events. And then, yeah, now we're like really busy with gigs every weekend. Wicked. So. Wicked. Yeah, it's good. Right, we always start our podcast with the same question. It's quite a broad question, but it sort of eases you in a little bit. What does music mean to you? Um, God, <laughs> probably everything really, because it's just my life. I don't know what I'd do without music, to be honest with you. I, I love my sport and things like that, but um, just you hear music all the time. It's like, what would the world be mm. like music? It's strange, isn't it? But yeah, just everything really. Like I said, it's like I don't know what I'd do without music really, but yeah. I think that's a that's the most common answer we've had really. I think yeah, most most musicians, even if they're not gigging, will probably quite happily go and watch another yeah, band yeah. and 
even if you're in a group of mates that are all talking, your your attention will just drift. I'll just find myself looking at a band oh, or yeah, a, a singer that's on or whatever. Yeah. So obviously you started gigging at 10, you'd started with that. Where did the interest come from? What was the influence with your parents growing up? What were they listening to? What And what did you end up finding? So um, I remember for my christening, because my dad was on the Navy ships, they bought me a guitar. Um, and because obviously my dad was in bands in the Navy and stuff like that. So pretty much came from that. I remember he taught me a few like basic chords on that guitar. I must have been about five or six. And then from there, I kind of just had lessons with a tutor when we moved up here. Um, but yeah, trying to think what they they're interested in. My mum's not a massive music person; she'll just kind of listen to anything. You know what I mean? Um, whereas my dad just you two stuff like that. And <laughs> whereas now he's obsessed with Steven Sanchez. Have you heard of him? No, I'm not, I've not it's heard like, of Steven Sanchez. He's, he's 20 years old. He's from America, I think, and he's it's like it's like a bit of a young Elvis type right. thing. It's, right. it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but all I listen to is in downstairs, <laughs> listening to that. But, so your dad was in the Navy and you said he played in bands in yeah, the Navy. Yeah. Uh, so how did that come about then? Uh, well, I think he picked up the guitar a bit later than me, so maybe, maybe the age I am now. Right, yeah. Um, and then he found that he could sing like pretty decent as well, so he played guitar and sang in the bands. I think because there was loads of musicians that yeah. were on the ship as well. So whenever they'd dock somewhere, I think they'd kind of, Play right. a gig basically, okay. so he's basically played all over the world type oh, thing. That's wicked, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's pretty cool. It's all pictures and stuff in our house of it. <laughs> so, do you remember sort of accepting that Pemberton live gig, and and were you nervous about it? Were you excited? Did you throw yourself into it? What? How did it come yeah, about? Like, I was know? really nervous. I remember the first song, people clapped halfway through, and I remember I just stopped the performance. <laughs> I was like, well, "What is this?" And then, but I was, I was, I remember being so nervous about it. Um, but now I'm, I'm alright now. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was it was good, and I'm glad I did it. Yeah, definitely. Because I'd say if anyone's starting out, then live events are really good for yeah. people. Um, so it just gets your name out there a little bit. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, my first gig was Charlie Live, and it was uh, like it's busy, isn't it? Yeah, it depends yeah, where you do it. But um, well, you're not in a sweet shop or something. Yeah, I think I th- the first one I did was the Cow Shed in Pemberton. Yeah. And I did like a charity shop, and then a health food shop, and then then a sweet <laughs> shop, something like that. They're all just like cute little venues yeah. aren't they unorthodox style yeah, yeah yeah it's really good wicked yeah so how did that then progress on so you got the buzz for the first gig yeah um so i'm guessing it went well the first one yeah, yeah you got really the sort good. of reaction that you were hoping for and then i'm guessing you just go away then and, and practice really hard and, yeah. and did you remember your first paid gig or oh god I'm, i think it might have been um is it word and park in leyland yeah I think I might have done something for the council again there where they paid me. And I remember, if you know James Christie, yeah, he yeah. was there as well. Um, and then, yeah, I think that was it from there. Like I said, I did loads of charity stuff. And then now just doing pubs and stuff. I think I started doing pubs when I was about 13, 14. Right, okay. Regularly, so... Okay. Um, How did like, that work then with you being like underage and um, sort of you're not allowed in pubs past certain yeah, times? Yeah, I, I don't even know what we did to be, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I think it, the it. pubs were alright, but they knew my age. But right. um, it was more getting into the places in Manchester and Liverpool that I couldn't do. Um, but I, st- I don't do that now either, to be honest with you. I'd rather stay local. I'm the same. To be, is there a reason for that? Or <laughs> Just why would I travel there when I can do it in my local area where... Do you know what I mean? That's, no, that's what I think about it. But, yeah. I, uh, I had a few in, over in Liverpool and, and the, the fees weren't great either. Yeah. And the sort of, you know, you're paying for your pay, parking yeah, and all parking. that. And it's, yeah, it's tricky. And it? then it's difficult getting from the park into the venue. Exactly. So it's not like you can't just pull up outside, no, can you? No. Um, yeah. But that's the issue with them town centre type shows, they're difficult. It's strange though, isn't it? When you're in a big city, you'd think they'd, they'd pay for that, but it's, it's yeah. not really the way, is it? You no. can go in your local uh, local pub and they pay better than yeah, what they exactly. do sometimes. It's yeah. a strange one. So uh, and it's because I think because people accept it there, or you might get students who are coming on yeah, the train with it. like portable gear. Mm, yeah, they ju- they just get away with all that, and it, it it does wind you up. It really does wind you up. But what can you do if yeah. everyone if that's a rate they're willing to pay and people are accepting it, you can't then go in yeah, unless yeah. they've asked for you. To say right, well, my fee is going to be X amount. Well, we're only paying that amount. Yeah. It doesn't make any it's sense. It's crazy in Liverpool, isn't it? On like Matthew Street, they literally have acts like yeah. Yeah, every hour, don't they? Yeah. It's mental. All day, every day, yeah, don't yeah, they? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Like you say, I think I think uh, we had Justin Crow and he said they've literally got something in the cavern like all day, every yeah. day from about I can't remember what he said, like ten o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's mad. Isn't it? a gig on a but Tuesday. But they're always busy though, as well. It's yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I think that's just, they're the sort of places where people just come in and out all yeah. day because 
if you go into Liverpool, like you've got, it goes on from like, probably like you yeah. say yeah, about ten, 10 o'clock in the morning all night. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's amazing. ridiculous. <laughs> ten a.m. It's game. Th- that's what's different to Manchester and Liverpool. Isn't it? Like it just it always seems to be mm. an act on whereas in Manchester it, it it's similar but not to the extent they have it like every hour yeah. from ten a.m. Yeah. yeah, you can walk into any pub in Liverpool and there's acoustic acts yeah, on. Yeah. Like Manchester, it's mainly DJs or just loud playlists yeah. that the pub are playing or. <laughs> The, the club. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, how old are you now, Connor? Sorry. Twenty-one. So you're twenty-one, yeah. right? So, um, were there any bumps in the road as you was? So obviously you're gigging at thirteen, fourteen. Imagine that's quite overwhelming going in these rowdy pubs. Yeah. Did it all? Was it all plain sailing? Were there a few challenges at the start? Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, people can be like, yeah. well, they've had a drink, so it's <laughs> difficult with my age as well. I think that's where I'm very grateful that my mum and dad have yeah. helped me out a lot. They've always like protected me if. You know, they can see someone's getting. So do they come to all your gigs? Yeah, then, they, yeah, they, yeah. obviously it's either one of them now, like yeah. mum or dad will come. Um, but at the start, it was both of them just to make sure I was all right. Um, but yeah, it's like it's ex- expensive the equipment as well, and you don't want it getting wrecked by someone yeah. being drunk. But yeah, that's that's probably the, one of the challenges I'd say is have just making sure I was all right with yeah. my age. Yeah, um, it is especially if someone wants a song that you don't do or, you know, it's a, people can get a bit in your face, yeah. can't they? So it's, yeah. it's I remember we had one with us this Christmas party once and this woman threw a bauble at me <laughs> off the Christmas tree, picked up, well, threw the bauble at me. I was like, oh, I'm out of here. You just stopped? Yeah, I just you? left. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I, I'm not having that type thing. Well, I, must have, I must have been about 14, 15 right, as well. Okay. Just lobbed the bauble at me. <laughs> I was like, what? No content. <laughs> Just, no, just love uh, the ball. Didn't want a song that you no. can do well, aggressively as well. Yeah, it was quite look, aggressive. <laughs> she yeah. had a look on her face. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like we always right. remember that story. Not just, oi, no. play that song for us. What you <laughs> I remember it, it scraped across my hand as well. Oh, oh. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you get paid for that though? You just yeah, get yeah. up Because like, I, I was about to finish anyway. Yeah, yeah. But, oh, that was but I'll take payment first. Oh, I'm not playing yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, so, um, so going through then, so you've, um, you're 21 now, so you've gone from playing regularly. Was that your sort of, I imagine you're at school, aren't you, in college? So that's yeah. sort of your full-time job, uh, per se. Did you have any other jobs as you were, no, it was just all music? just music. I've never really, the only thing that I've done now is I've just accepted a teaching role on a Thursday night, but other than that, I've not had anything, really. Okay, that's cool. I'm quite lucky to be Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> Let's hope you don't have to get a yeah, job in the real world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just during COVID, I was like, oh, God, this, yeah. is, this is absolutely rubbish. That's another challenge, actually. During, yeah. during that, it was terrible. Well, go on then, talk to us about uh, your experiences well, through just, that. I, you could see, like, my girlfriend was just, still working in Tesco and stuff like that and I just couldn't do anything um, but then I, I kept it up by doing the online gigs and stuff like that so people enjoyed that they tune in every week and um, I got my following grew really, a lot during mm. COVID so it was actually quite a good thing as well yeah, um, were you doing the live street, the yeah. Facebook lives and all that? Yeah, Facebook yeah. lives and then there was a good group called I think it was Rock the Lockdown don't know if you've heard of that yeah yeah I had like 2 million followers on Facebook right so you'd, you'd do a live stream on one of them it would it, the views would be amazing. Right. Then you could just invite people. Ah. So my page grew loads from that. So that was a good thing about it. So could you see how many people were watching it when you were yeah, live? Yeah, it, it was men. It was like 400, 500 people at one time, yeah, yeah, yeah. just because of that group. Um, but yeah, it was really good that. But obviously, I couldn't work during that yeah. time. Did you consider maybe getting a different job or was it always, when we get back, music will be back? Yeah, or were you a bit worried I'd, about yeah, that? Yeah, that's the one thing as well. I was worried about that. I didn't know whether gigs would stay the same or... Um, people would still remember me or whatever, mm. but it's been fine. So. Yeah, it's been all yeah, right. Yeah. It? I think, if anything, I think they, there's been more opportunities after after yeah, COVID. I, I don't yeah, know about yourself. I've been busier since. Yeah, I, I think it's. I think it depends what you're doing because I've noticed there's a lot more pubs turning towards the acoustic acts or solo artists. Yeah. Um, my band have been very lucky. We we kind of started and probably were going to get our first gig just before COVID happened, and we had yeah. a private party booked in for peanuts as well and it got cancelled but because Chris our lead singer was doing the live streams every yeah. week I did a couple and then he knew loads of pubs in Longridge so it like it's good that, that went as well booked. Isn't it, that went booked yeah. that went absolutely mental Longridge is great to be fair for gigs and they really support live music yeah. I've, I've had the same where it's just been mental yeah it's mad isn't it just picking up cancellations was like it booked me for a whole year yeah it's really good 
Um, uh, so what sort of songs were you playing at that time? Because at 13, 14, I almost had that attitude, like, where I wasn't going to sell myself out. <laughs> I'm not going to play all these popular songs. What sort of attitude did you have? I was obsessed age? with Ed Sheeran, wasn't I, at that time? So I remember just being, oh, I just wanted to just play him. Um, more poppier stuff, really, whereas now I like more of my indie type stuff. Um, but yeah, Ed Sheeran, James Arthur, I think what else I was playing at that time. Just stuff you hear in the charts, really. Yeah, probably good for gigs because people yeah. like all that stuff, don't they? So. Whereas now it's it's more diverse. Like, I think I only do one Ed Sheeran song now. And you're lucky if I even, I even play it now. But, <laughs> uh, I still like him, but it's obviously I don't want to just ram people down <laughs> Your the taste have, have widened yeah, a bit yeah, as well. Yeah, like, so. obviously, yeah. Because yeah. um, we're gigging 11 years, I see what people like, do you know what I mean? So Yeah. Just, That's mad you've been gigging for 11 years and you're yeah, 21. I, know, isn't it? <laughs> I think I started at about 26. <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's, uh, it's crazy, that really. I feel but. like I've been doing it so long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, feel like a 40-year-old man. <laughs> yeah. like, you're telling 27-year-olds, telling oh, don't worry, you just need to get 10 gigs out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what do you think you've improved on the most in that time? Obviously, maybe the singing and guitar playing comes quite naturally to you because you've done it since a young age. What about like talking to the crowds and your, um, your stage presence and stuff? Has that grown? Still quite bad at that. Is it right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm quite, tough, I'm quite reserved on on stage. I don't know why. Um, I hate looking at people. I'm certain, like, yeah. really bad with eye contact. Do you, um, do you tend to close your eyes a lot yeah. when you sing? I do oh, that yeah. all the time. Or, or I, what I'll do is I like, it looks like you're looking at the crowd, but you're just looking down the centre <laughs> of the <laughs> microphone. Yeah, that's a good tip, actually, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, yeah I'd, I'd hate to listen to myself when I was younger, whereas now I don't mind, like, just listening back on a video. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. Um, so I'd say my voice has improved the most. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any sort of vocal training? No, or you just all sort of... No, nothing. Yeah. The only thing I had is when I went on The Voice when I was about 16, um, and I'd... They give you vocal right, training. Okay. That. So that's the only thing I'd add. Okay. Um, but other than that, no, nothing. Did you find that helped your voice though? Like that, yeah. that little bit of vocal training? Yeah, she was amazing as well, the, the woman I had. So. What did it specifically do? Did it like increase your range? Did it just get you more control? What What did you find it actually gave you as a uh, vocal coach? I felt like it was the breathe, the breathing definitely. The, the mm. she got spot on, and it was it was how to like pronunciate your words better as well. I was always terrible at that, mm. and she helped with that a lot. Um, the vowel shaping and all that, yeah. Yeah, but you you'd go in. I must have had about four or five like hour vocal coaching right. sessions with her. Um, which was amazing. So, what was that experience like on the voice? And did you make it far? Or uh, no, I got onto the bit where you could sing in front of the right, okay. the, the, um, the coaches, um, but just didn't get a turn. Yeah, that what, was it. Really. What was that like? Though? It was. It, that was amazing. Yeah. I did X Factor as well. I got asked to do X Factor, um, and then again, I sang in front of the four judges. So, was that at sixteen? Did you say? Yeah, I think I was fifteen when right, I did X okay, Factor, yeah, and then yeah. the year after, I did the voice straight straight away. Yeah. Are you just? Um, I, <laughs> I'm trying to get myself in that in that thing where you're willing for them to turn round yeah. whilst also trying to focus oh, on it's, your it's, it's only 90 seconds as well. You right, know, so okay. Imagine that, it's not a long yeah. time. So you walk out and you walk, you feel like you're off already because it's, it's, it's like that. But And you can hear the crowd trying to like, <laughs> egg them on and stuff like that. But it was good. But yeah. I just wish they would have been able to turn and tell you, no, if you know, like, why they give didn't you some turn. feedback? Did they not even no, give you anything afterwards? No, you just walk straight off. Oh, that's a shame, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Whereas on the kids' one, they turn around and tell mm. them. But yeah, there's been that lad from Chorley, and I forgot his name now. Is it Will? Will Edgar. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lad he supported me. Uh, oh, one of my gigs, he's really good. Wicked, um, yeah. yeah there's nice another lad. lad. I think he's mates with him. He's gigged with him a couple of times. Yeah, he's Blackburn by any, but I can't yeah. think of his name now. Oh, God, that's gone, yeah. Yeah, but uh, anyway. So, so Connor, you, you go to uni and you study music. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about what you studied and, and what you... Uh... So, um, after college, I didn't... I, well, no, after high school, sorry, I didn't want to do, like, normal college and mm. stuff. Um, so we went for an open day at uni and that's all they did a college course um, so that was just songwriting um, but obviously that I did it during Covid so it was all online so then I thought I'd go to the uni as well so now I do songwriting and production um, which is it's alright yeah it's good I'm in my final year now so get finished and then I'll see what's going to happen after Wicked. that really. so songwriting so Obviously, you write your own songs. Yeah. Um, did, have you felt like the courses help you become a better songwriter? Yeah, it? yeah, it definitely has in that aspect. So like, obviously, because there's loads of other musicians as well, and you're seeing what they're doing and what techniques they're, they're like, putting in their songs as well. So that's definitely helped in that sense. And obviously, I wasn't the best like 
at writing lyrics, but okay. they've definitely made you like think and explore yeah. how to do that better. What's the main things they've, you've sort of learned lyrically then? Um, I, don't, I don't know. It's just because they push you to write all the time. You feel like you get the bad ones out of the yeah. way, if you know what I mean? Whereas it, I would just sit at home and not do it. Mm. Um, but because they're giving you constant like, assignments of write a song for, for this brief as well. So right. it, it makes you think, oh, I need to put it in that. Aspect. What's the weirdest brief you've had? Oh, <laughs> so, they're all weird yeah, briefs, though, aren't they? Yeah. Strange. Just like, I don't even know. Like writing songs for games, I think that's. Right. I would, would never think to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but obviously, you get that type of stuff. What video games, like? Yeah, yeah. And that's vocals being on that yeah, as well. It can be as well. Yeah, that's uh, whereas some people don't put the vocals on and they'll mm. just do like a piece on Logic and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I imagine your skills on on software like Logic and stuff. Yeah, oh yeah, I knew nothing. Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely something I'd say as well. I've noticed off a few of your videos and stuff on your Facebook, you 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 seem to have a good setup yeah. where you've got your, your your good mic and you, and you seem like you've very well. Is that that really helped you? Yeah, with that? definitely. Like yeah. Knowing the software to use, and I didn't have a clue. I think I just used GarageBand before I yeah. went there. And um, but yeah, since I've gone there, especially because the studios are amazing, mm. um, and even like the little like side studios they have have all got like the equipment you'd use at home. So you can see why you go in there all the time if you lived in. Obviously, I don't live in so. Um, but yeah, they've definitely helped in that aspect. Just because songwriting, you kind of everyone uses Logic now. Mm. Yeah. Um, even to just write a song, you see some people just use it. Or record a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely just knowing like what effects to put on mm. EQs, they're just, that's helped a lot. Yeah, it's a minefield, isn't it? But it's definitely worth worth having. Do you feel that translates into your gigs as well, where you're getting the best yeah, sound sounds, out of yeah. your live performance? Oh, I'm a perfectionist with stuff like oh, that. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I am as well. Not always, uh, not always the best at it, but uh, you try, don't you? Well, yeah, did, obviously, because there's loads of different modules you can choose, so I chose a live sound uh, one as well. Yeah. So you had to like set up a band in 20 minutes and sound right. check it so that was quite intense imagine that yeah, yeah. so well, they it takes my band an hour to set yeah. up <laughs> yeah. 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 All, the, all the PA would be there and all the equipment would be there but you'd just have to mic everything up yeah. right and make but so you'd like put it on a pen drive and you'd already done all the the mix basically uh, you just had to hope it was okay yeah <laughs> the EQ is awful the EQ is the worst thing because you EQ something wrong it'll get in the way of yeah. another instrument so you have to find a way where the mids aren't quite the same as that guitar yeah, yeah. the other guitar's got to be EQ'd differently so you get a di bit more low end or a bit more yeah. high end it's just it is a minefield like, I don't know how they, these big acts do it if you know like thousands of inputs yeah like, on these big stages yeah, it was amazing though like because the guy who taught the lesson is like best friends with Sam Fender's sound engineer right, right. so he brought him in uh -huh. And then he plugged in his um, like pen drive, and Sam Fender's sound came on. Right. And then they just press play, and you were hearing his live set from Glastonbury. Uh. So you could mix Sam Fender's set. Wow, so that was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So you're just any cue, and it's your taste. Yeah, and, and oh, we could, that yeah. actually sounds quite fun to me. Yeah, fair, that yeah. was good. That lesson, I really yeah, enjoyed wicked. that. So what's your setup like at gigs? Then do you loop or yeah, you do loop. a bit of looping? Um, yeah, that's I've started doing that straight away. Okay. Uh, when I was ten. Was uh, that because of the Ed Sheeran influence? Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas now the other artists I like use them as well now, so it seems like it's growing a lot. Um, so yeah, I loop and just and then some gigs I take electric and piano as well, but it more be the band type of stuff where I'm yeah. taking that. But yeah, the yeah, looping is a big thing in my gigs. So so. Again, where did you where did your influence? Obviously, you've transferred from doing covers gigs going into like into the songwriting where did the influence come from to write your first song uh, god <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah but yeah again, I remember we went to go and watch him in Blackpool I was like oh, I maybe should give that a go myself type thing um, so I wrote a song and then that actually got released last year so that was pretty cool and that, that was still like I still liked it enough to release yeah. it years later um, but yeah definitely him i'd say did you find like again it was that there's a light there was, no it was promised that one that, promise yeah that i wrote right. years so ago you get your first song you got you're really happy with it you're still happy with it now yeah. what were the next 10 like because yeah, that, that's why because you're trying to compete with that aren't you that's what's so difficult <laughs> about song a lot of songwriters i don't know how like you see like these big eyes and they just produce 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 mm. and it's almost as good as the last one that big teams in it yeah know? yeah that's it yeah. as well. <laughs> I find it so much easier writing with other people you know mm. when you you know like we had a project where we, we wrote like a five songs like a mini EP and it was just 
I would not have been able to do that on my own. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of them because when you start out songwriting, your first song is either utterly horrendous, yeah. bang average, or or absolutely brilliant. There's no, there's sort of no middle ground between those. There's no grey areas in those. Yeah. It's either straight down the road. You've got no idea about the structure, but you've got some good ideas, or you've got no good ideas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm so I'm a, the next ten will be like awful because yeah. you've, you're looking at that one going, well, it's got to be as good as that one. Yeah. Like I remember I hated "There's a Light" when I wrote it. I literally mm. hated it. Whereas now it's like I'm one of my favourites. I think. I remember because I wasn't even going to record that, you know. And then my dad was like, oh, you, sh- "You should record that one. It's quite good." And, and then I did, and then I like it now. So. Why? What did? You, what did you not I like? Don't know. About it? I just, I did didn't... you change it from that point? Or no, is it still the literally same? kept it right, the same. Okay, yeah. I, I wrote. I remember I wrote it like the first two weeks in lockdown, and then I was like, oh, "No, it's not that good. This I'm not sure about it." <laughs> and then a year later, when it might have been two actually, when I came to record it, I was like, "Dad, I need to pick four songs. What should I pick?" He's like, "Pick that. Trust me." I was like, oh. So anyway, that was his advice was good because now it's like I think it's everyone's favourite song. Yeah, that's so, your, your best yeah, one, yeah, really. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, it was a good choice. Obviously, I think I liked it more when I heard a full band playing yeah, it as well. Yeah. That definitely helps. That's the thing, isn't it? Um, so is the band actually made up of people you're at uni with, or is nah, it? Well, yeah, one of them is, and then another lad is John Rayner plays drums. He's from Preston, but yeah. he went to BIM as well, the uni. I oh, he's County Pilots, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah County Pilots, yeah. Um, and then yeah. And I, we, he told me about all the others as well, basically. So he helped out a lot um, in terms of musicians. Um, but yeah, w- the guitarist is from my uni. He's amazing, honestly. Nice. Insane player. <laughs> so when you're writing with other people, what do you find the benefits of that are? Um, lyrics. Lyrics, okay. Because yeah. I, I think I'm quite good at like the, the tune type thing and the melody, but finding lyrics to match with it, uh, I found other people a bit better at. So obviously... If, if I'm trying to push it more to write with other people, I think, um, just because they helped out a lot when I wrote did that project. And one of the songs off the EP was wrote with them two people, so um, yeah, definitely lyrics they helped with. So songwriting wise, how how do you do it? Do you sit and and just play chords or melodies like you say, or have you ever just come up with a lyric and then you've tried to put the music to that? Is it a bit it's of both? Def- definitely chords first. Chords, yeah. yeah. I, I'd always just sit down and pick up the guitar and find something that I like first. I see. And writing lyrics. It's interesting. Um, I'm not sure how people do that. It's, yeah. I'd find that the, the hardest way to do it, but yeah. I think it just depends what, what, what your background maybe yeah. is, I yeah, suppose. But, yeah, definitely yeah, chords first. Yeah, wicked. Yeah. I think that's the thing with a lot of songwriters because how do you know what your rhythm and melody is going to be like if you haven't got any yeah, chords? Exactly. Like, that, yeah, that's, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, but one, of my, one of my friends, he was a guitarist, he played bass as well. Yeah, for some reason, he used to write his lyrics first. I, I never got it. The yeah. songs turned out absolutely brilliantly, Great, yeah. but I don't know how the hell he made it fit with his music. Yeah. It's just it's just beyond me that people write that way. Well, um, people almost like write poems, don't they? Yeah. yeah. And then put them to it, you know. But, uh, yeah, how do you, how the hell do you find your key or anything? Like, <laughs> what, what like some people just give lyrics to other people, don't they? And yeah. they, then they write the chords. It's like... Yeah. No, I couldn't yeah. do that. No, yeah. no that, that wouldn't be for me. <laughs> be hard. I'd find it hard to fit like them in spaces. Exactly. As well. I'd have to take so much stuff out, and well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's weird. I mean, obviously, you said they help with lyrics. When you're writing a song with them, like, do you just go in and say, right, here's the acoustic version. You put whatever you want over the top, or do you have an idea of what your drum kit, the drum beat, wants to be like? What yeah. bass line, what needs to be? Or so I remember just... when we did it, I'd just bring them something that I'd like chords wise and then I just we'd just go from there pretty much because um, they knew that was kind of my expertise type thing and then right. I knew that theirs was the lyrics so I just left them to that so I'd, I'd bring them to something obviously then I could I find it easier when they start something and then I can chip in if you know what I mean yeah. lyrics wise um, but definitely I'd bring them a chord sequence and then they'd go from there basically yeah so do you find that have you ever heard a song fully formed in your head and thought right this drum beat needs to be sort of in the like something like this. You've never done that at no, all. No, obviously because I've always been an acoustic, mm. just on my own. Maybe that's why. And all the artists that I did like never really played to bands. Um, but now I think as I've like started playing with a band myself, maybe the music is. I do think of that a little yeah. bit. Um, obviously, I have an idea when I'm going in the studio as well of kind of what I want it to sound like. Yeah. Um, 
and he was good with that. The guy that did the four songs, he kind of let me have my creative freedom, which is good. He didn't like put his stamp. He did, but not like overrided what I wanted. If you know what I mean. So that was good. Yeah, I think that's a that is a difficulty because again, you've got the song how you imagine it, yeah. and a producer's going there to try and get the best out of that song. Producers yeah. generally, the second pair of ears are always the best set of ears because probably where your songwriting has come from, like where you said with lyrics, if something's shit, then someone's going to tell you it's yeah. shit. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, I find it quite helpful now, but at first I'll be like really defensive about it because it's your <laughs> thing, isn't yeah, it? It's yeah. your product. Like, is it easy to almost let go when someone's telling you you think something's a good line? Yeah. And the bandmates are going, nah, mate, you need to change that as well. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it's difficult. I, like I said, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I'd never show it to someone unless I was 100% sure. Um, but yeah, they're, like the band as well, they're not, they're kind of just happy to play my songs, if you know what I mean. They're, yeah. they're very nice like that. Like They they all put the effort in, like, in terms of learning stuff quickly. And um, But yeah, obviously when we were in that group writing the songs, they... They would say whether they didn't like something, which was I like that as well because then mm. we did a bit of discussion in it what what they think's best, what I think's best. Um, but yeah, it was good. We could we're going to take a very short. We only get half an hour in between these, and the cameras stop. So uh, we'll have a quick break, and we'll come back to Connor very shortly. Cheers. See you in a minute. Hello there. Sorry to interrupt your episode. Just going to take a moment out to advertise me and my massive ego. No, we'd like you to go and check me out as a performer. It's Luke B. Sings on Facebook and Instagram. I don't do all the TikTok and all that business, so it's just those two social medias. You can have a little look at my upcoming gig dates. You can have a look at a few cover videos and stuff like that. And yeah, just generally see what I'm up to as a, as a solo performer and as a member of the One More Song Trio and Age Gap Duo as well. So yeah, go and check me out. Give me a like and a follow. And uh, for all inquiries and whatever else, just drop me a message on, on one of those pages. Back to the episode. Yeah. Right, we're back for part two of uh, our episode. Hope you're enjoying it, Connor. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> good stuff. So we're just going to continue where we left off, really. So uh, I was interested, you were saying about um, you get very obsessed with your sound at live gigs and stuff yeah. like that. What's your general experience like when you get to a gig? Are you, are you stressed and nervous or are you not bothered anymore? No, sort of thing? I think because I've set it up so many times. So many times, like, yeah. Just, I'm, hopefully it should be all right. Yeah. Um, obviously, when I've set up on Saturday, I was a bit like, well, I remember how to do it. But yeah, it's alright because I know now that I can just kind of leave the desk yeah. and just the volume basically. Yeah, um, so you've got your standard template. Kind yeah, of thing, yeah, and yeah. You, yeah, yeah. Do you find that does ever change? It's it's probably a rare situation, but like when you get to a like really reverby yeah. venue or like where it's got all hard floors. Oh, that's a nightmare. The hard floors. Mm. Well, we've got a little carpet that we sit underneath the right. The sound system and that's defo helped in terms of kind of keeping it as absorbing it a little bit as much as possible. It's quite thick as well, so I just put that under the bass unit, and that's helped a lot in terms of keeping it the same. Um, sometimes some venues you just have to take a bit of low end out, and it's yeah. all right. Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Because like, what, I think that was one of the things that you struggled with to begin with. Mm. One of the things I struggled with, I had like four or five gigs and carpeted venues, and the sound was perfect. Yeah. The next one, yeah, all hard floor. Like the walls were dead thin, so the sound was just bouncing yeah. around everywhere. I'm like, How, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah, <laughs> so that's why if I see a carpet, I'm like, I'm going to. I'm yeah. going to that bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely an easy night. I went to the station, I got to the station quite regularly yeah. in Preston. For some benign reason, for this last gig, my granddad's drum were going mad, my guitar were going mad, and it's, all, it's just it's sometimes very random, isn't it? Yeah. And you like have to sort of scrap the template and start yeah. again almost, even though it's the same room, same, you know, it's, it's odd, it's strange yeah. sound I mean, sometimes. There are tricks where you completely take out frequencies and slowly get it mm. up to the point where it just starts to bite. Yeah. You get what you want, but Christ, it just takes ages in those venues and you're like, oh, you've got like five minutes before you start yeah. and your sound check's just gone horrible. You're like, oh my God, just get it right now. <laughs> That's one thing that stresses me out. I'm glad I wear in ears now. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, I know my sound's all right out there. I'll just stick them in. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's always sounds the same in them, so. We've just moved to them as well. How are you finding them? It's class, isn't yeah, it? Do you yeah. put the two in or yeah, just one? Yeah. Well, or, yeah. my dad tells me to put two in. He's like, keep the two in. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I want to have a little listen. I'll just take, yeah. take one out. What's yeah. your experience like with it? Because some, because I've started going to two, 
um, and you feel like you're cut off from the room a bit as yeah, well like that's, sometimes. That's the only thing they'll say, they say, oh, you don't, you don't engage as much when mm. I have both of the men. But I don't know, I'd rather sound, I'd rather it sound better to me, than, yeah. you know what I mean? Definitely. Have but, you tried putting like spare mics out for like ambience Yeah, well, when I do the, the f- gigs with the full band, he puts two out, so then right. I can. Does can, that make a big difference? Yeah, Because yeah. not exp- I've not experienced that yeah, yet. Yeah, you can hear it a lot better. Is it better, yeah. Um, so obviously he's good at sound, James Gelson, who does the band stuff. Um, but yeah, he just sticks two on either side of the mm. stage. And we've done, oh, what have we done now? Three gigs with him? Might be two actually, but yeah, it's been perfect. We could, yeah. yeah is, that, is that from an ear protection perspective or yeah, just because you want to hear yourself? Yeah, drums blasting me on yeah, the yeah. bass, electric guitar, I'm like... <laughs> yeah, getting stick on there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is awful. I've, I've noticed it with the band and like, I didn't even, like, I think I've said this on another podcast, but first, like, all I could hear was the dry sound of our uh, lead guitarist's uh, guitar. Yeah. When I plug put the in ears in, I was like, have you, have you always had that much reverb yeah. with your guitar? I couldn't hear any of it. Smart on it. And then like, I've got, a, I do gigs with just a drummer as well. Um, and we played to a click track with that. Uh, he's so like into it. Like with the, yeah. he, he's the one that got me into the in ears. So he like, he, he like plays tracks off his pad and yeah, it's all to click. So everything, it's, it should sound the same every gig. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's, proper ways with that type of stuff <laughs> is but, it like the pad thing where he like he just hits a pad just yeah, before the song and it, it triggers sings. shit but I, I don't, honestly don't know how he does it like because yeah, he has to click it at the exact moment mm. with the click whilst also playing drums <laughs> to start the track at the, that time I'm like how are you actually doing that? But I just you got like, used to playing with a click. Yeah, then, like. I, I didn't like it at the start, yeah. and I thought I thought I'd always be rubbish at it because I was. But then when I went in the studio, I got used to it a little yeah. bit. And then with him, it's just it's having it at the right volume. If you've got it at that volume, it's easy to stay in time. Mm. Um, makes sense. But it just like I said, it makes sure you're not if you're a bit nervous, you're not rushing a song. Do you know what I mean? Or yeah. going too slow. So it's yeah. always at that pace, yeah, which is good. Wicked. Yeah. So you moved from doing the, well, you're obviously still doing the covers and, and everything, but when was that first time you started to have original gigs? I know you play at the ferret a little bit, don't you? Yeah. Um, I don't think I did now. I must have, it was during COVID actually. Right. I got asked if I'd play at the ferret for this, I think it was a charity thing. Um, and that was all your own music Yeah, at that but there was point, no yeah. one there and it was just recorded for uh, people at home. Yeah, they did quite a lot of them. I think they did like Fridays and Saturdays yeah. every week or something yeah, like that. Yeah, so I, she was like, oh, if you could do it, because it was Seamus McLaughlin that recommended me. Cause, um, and they were like, oh, it'd be good if you could do as much as your own stuff as possible. So I did that. And then I was like, what'd I do then? I think last year I really wanted to like, obviously released my own music so I did a gig on my own of all my own music but just me and then I did one at Chorley Theatre uh, yeah. uh, but that was full band uh, and then we did one at the Conti as well yeah. um, full band and then we've got one coming up in a few weeks at the Playhouse Theatre in Preston yeah. so yeah. yeah we just just need to get some practice in for that <laughs> um, what was that transition like from covers to originals? Do, do you, did you find you enjoyed it more? Was it more vulnerable because it's your own music? Yeah, I get. I, I never get nervous to covers, but when I'm them gigs with the band and on like my own stuff, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's. I think Chris Haley said it. You're like putting yourself out there to be judged with original music. You're doing that twice because yeah. it's not just. It's not just you playing that they're looking at and you're singing. They're looking at your own songs like. Have, yeah. you, have you got anything about you yeah. basically it's but they're good though like, I enjoy it I, you get a lot more satisfaction out of it than mm. just playing someone else's songs you know what I mean what was uh, that very first original gig like then where yeah. people have actually sat watching your music well, I was like is this going to do well and it's it's sold out in like a day so I was like oh, right brilliant I'm going to have to actually like make sure this is this is good <laughs> um so yeah we, was that the one at Charlie Little Theatre no though? that was at, um, it was at the Arts Centre in Pemberton. Ah, yeah. so it was quite a small capacity but it was nice if you know what I mean for there and then I think I, straight away after we saw that I was like oh, maybe I should do like a, a bigger venue um, so we did the theatre and that pretty much sold out as well, well so yeah. how does the process work for that because are you doing it through a promoter or are you doing no, it just on my own right much. so how have you like how does it go from you getting obviously some places you have to hire a PA yeah. in, or you have to you you don't have to bring it in. You but you have to be the one to organise yeah, all that. Yeah. So how does it go from start to finish? Obviously, you give the venue your dates. Do you have to pay to hire the venue? Yeah, you have to pay to hire there. Um, so that's also then you got to think. Well, how much am I going to charge tickets to make sure? Mm. Obviously, I'm not that bothered about making money because it's my own stuff, and I just want to 
get it out there, if you know what I mean. But obviously, I've got five band members to pay. Mm. I've got a sound engineer to pay. Yeah, like you know what I mean. It doesn't. It does need to make money. Um, so yeah, that, it was it was difficult because I'm trying to organise everything, and for there you had to bring your own PA, and obviously my PA wouldn't be loud enough full band for that. So we had to hire obviously James in, and he did it. And then, but the Conti one, there's a PA there, and it's the same PA as he brings. So, um, that was definitely good about that venue. Quite a bit of organising for the Charlie Little Fields yeah, one, then. Yeah, very. And then this one is pretty much the same as well yeah. um, for Preston. So, you're yeah. having to do all the, I imagine you may be trying to sell a bit of merchandise. Yeah, yeah. you're trying to um, promote it as yeah. well. And then, also like creating all the posters and yeah. that type of thing. But, um, yeah, it's it's rewarding. Good though. fun though, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mega. Like, so what was that like then? I, I remember there being a little bit of talk about oh, Connor's playing at the Charlie Little Theatre. Um, a couple of people I know, I think, came to watch yeah, it. Like, yeah. did Scott come yeah, and watch Scott it? Came, I think, yeah, as well. Yeah. So what what was? A, I bet that was a pretty cool experience because the theatre when it's when it's busy is it Packed. probably quite fun. Yeah. Like, you know, it was, I think we sold like two hundred and fifteen tickets. That's wicked, so. yeah. Was it seated or standing? Yeah, seated. Yeah. yeah. And then I did. What did I, I did a standing one. I was like, oh, I don't know. I kind of prefer this. Um, I think the atmosphere is a little bit better yeah. when you got people standing. Um, and then I tried. I did one in Manchester as well at the Castle Hotel. Have you heard of that? Uh, I've heard of sure, it. Yeah. I've heard of it. Don't. I've not seen anything. Yeah. But I think it great, might have just popped great up on Facebook. Venue, or that. So that was all standing as well. Um, but the last they were midweek, so I was like, well, maybe I'd sell a bit more tickets at weekends. So the last few ones we've done, we've done them at like Friday or Saturday night. Um, so yeah, they've they've done well as well. I suppose you can see the benefit then of um, accumulating, I suppose, a bit of a fan base from your covers gigs yeah. and from the online stuff. Yeah. Do you think they work hand in hand then, the covers gigs? And then, because obviously you're, you can then bring people to your original exactly. gigs, can't so, you? Is that e how it works? Yeah, really? everyone there I know has sent me from covers. Yeah, wicked, and then, yeah. And then they're there to see if they like the original stuff as well. And then if they like it, they're buying a CD or yeah. a poster or that type of thing. That's so, a good way to do it. Yeah. They're, very, they're very supportive, the people like that have come to watch me from very young like there's still people that watch me from when I was 10 that yeah. still come and watch me now I'm like <laughs> fair play oh, it's cool. really hard that I, I as I said earlier in the break I do originals and I find like you just don't I, like the people that come and watch me just want to hear songs they know Yeah. so it's you know I think my mates are starting to come round to the idea of mine now but like when it's just acoustic and you're like oh I'm playing my own songs acoustic and they've heard it full band you can just almost yeah. When you try to sell it, you almost have to oversell it. Oh, it's really stripped back and all this. Yeah. How have you found, like, obviously you've said you've got the following. How have you found, again, the transition of how you market that? Do you almost feel like you have to oversell it a little yeah, bit? Yeah, a little bit it's as well because it, they're like, well, I can come and go and watch you for free doing mm -hmm. covers, whereas I'm having to pay five to ten pounds for a ticket for this. Why, why should I? Do you know what I mean? Obviously they wouldn't say that, but it's that kind of thing of why would they do that? But they have so I, I, I think you just got to promote them more than you mm. the covers gigs pretty much because you know a pub's going to be busy anyway really yeah. don't you so then you just definitely have to push them a lot more it's like constantly reminding people there's this show you need to, you need to come <laughs> and watch it now. yeah yeah there's a link yeah literally how uh, did that work then because I was well like, I might be wrong but it seems like you've got about four songs out as original yeah. songs so how did that then work into a full night's gig did you uh, do a, a few covers as well yeah or? so what we did what um, we played for about an hour and a bit so we, we're doing the four songs off the EP that I released and then about six or seven more of like unreleased ones um, but some people know them you know from like watching me ah uh, yeah so like they kind of know the songs and like oh you need to release that you need to do that uh, and then we do about three or four uh, yeah. covers as well just to make sure people like yeah Keep them interested yeah. and oh here's a bit here's one you're more familiar yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have support acts as yeah. well? Yeah. So what did it, the first one I had Seamus McLaughlin, uh, who's like a massive inspiration to me. I, I don't know how he's not made it. It's like <laughs> it's crazy. Um and then Will Edgar, of course, who we mentioned, he did the last one. And then I had Nick Spence, if you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Spence, and yeah. Ian Bailey. Uh yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I've had them and they've all been amazing. Oh, so. brilliant. Um, and yeah. they all put their original tunes in as well. Yeah, does it, Nick write his own tunes? I'm then? not sure if he does. I think yeah. he might. Have, I just told him to do covers, you know, to get everyone going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see that at, at, at um, big gigs, don't yeah, you? Yeah. Where they sometimes have a cover singer on before yeah. the big acts. Yeah, yeah. I think it depends on it depends on like what level you're at because obviously if you if you're at a certain level, you don't need a cover singer no. to get you going, do you? It's, no. It's, I think it's I think it's more when it's sort. You might be on the cusp of going big yeah. or. 
Yeah, but he did a great job, so <laughs> wicked. very happy. Yeah, he's um, good, Nick, isn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah I like but him. Ian does some of his own stuff. Wicked. And uh, Seamus did as well. Uh, Will did as well. He yeah. started releasing, hasn't he? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he's, he's a nice lad, Will, as well. So yeah. I was glad we were going to try and get him on, actually, yeah, at some point. Definitely. With his mate that was... That we, we can't remember his name, um, but we were going to try and get him, because they both went on The Voice, didn't they? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're going to look into that. But yeah, shout out, Will, if you're maybe watching Connor's episode. Yeah, get in touch. <laughs> at Tom's Cast One. Yeah. <laughs> so where does your priorities lie, then? Obviously, there's only so many hours in the day. Do you find yourself... Do you, what, what's a typical week like for you in terms of practice? And, and are you, like... You, when you wake up in the morning, are you thinking about your original music or are you thinking about, right, I've got to get ready for these covers gigs? What um, what, what kind of, you know? I don't practice now, you know. No, it's... No. Yeah, you know, I think because I'm out so much that I kind of... It's based, that's the practice. If you, I know mm. that sounds bad, but... No, it's yeah. true, yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like I, I wouldn't really need to do it. Obviously, if it, an original gig, I'm like, yeah, let's make sure this mm. is, this is yeah. spot on. But um, typical week, I'm just... Call it that uni, sorry. And then I just love my sports, so I'm... Doing stuff I like, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, well, you playing a bit of sport. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what, football, or? football, golf. Yeah. I love because, my golf. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I if I can, I like obviously because I missed it when I was away. Straight away when I got him, I was like, yeah, I need to pick up the guitar. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Do you find you're not doing as many of the covers to go online and stuff as well? Like you know, with your Facebook page. Yeah, and I don't. YouTube I don't post that. as much now to be yeah. fair. I'm trying to it's keep difficult, it. Difficult, isn't it? It's like how do I make sure people still know I'm a covers artist, but I also mm. want to make it look more like a an artist if you know what I mean yeah do you um, think those two things have to be sometimes separate as well yeah well you change your name to like a what well, you call defined by aren't you mm. so it's almost like a a separate title or yeah. a separate artist almost. well there's like, like some guy at uni that like gives advice and stuff like that he's like he knows some decent people and he said that I should create a different page mm. for the original stuff but it's like how could I lose that many that's followers the thing, that's isn't it? Far, yeah you're oh, starting again almost aren't you should I just and then that's why I've just decided to just kind of half and half it if you know what I mean but like I said it is difficult because people are like I wish you'd post more covers I wish I'd <laughs> I know but it's trying to keep it a songwriting thing as well and getting yeah. that yeah I think yeah I've <laughs> I work with a produ- production company called uh, Sugar House and they do oh, all yeah, my studio them, yeah. stuff they're amazing but he's like I was like right he's like if you've got any gigs coming up this year you need to put that on your EPK and all that sort of thing I was like well most of mine are covers he said no don't put them on then like yeah. keep it separate he said it's pointless he said you won't be you won't be valued as an artist if you yeah. do that so it's like Jesus like yeah. what do I do I've got this page like you say with that many followers what, what do you do well, I know a lot of like my friends that I've uni or college with. They they don't do any covers gigs, and they'll work a part time job instead mm. of doing that. Mm. Some are very anti covers. Yeah, aren't yeah. They? Well, yeah, and then so they'll they you'll see them. They're not gigging very often yeah. because the gigs that they do do are just mm. their own stuff, which is fair play. Like, but then, like you say, you'd have to then go as a full full time job yeah. or something else, so they, and then they, you lose they your practice. Do that, and... Yeah, I know someone that's like works at Sainsbury's, mm. and then he does the yeah, original I'm stuff imagine trying to get a Saturday off and that when they worked up time and stuff yeah. like that <laughs> that's the only thing I like doing the covers gigs as well yeah um, I think it also is a promotion thing of like oh I'm doing this original gig yeah yeah you should come to it if you like you might like it so yeah that's why it's a good thing as well Wicked. I think I did build up the following by doing that like a little bit because my original music it was before that I was just in an original band and again I was sort of like yeah, but if I played those covers, it wouldn't have the drums and it doesn't feel the same. Yeah. It, it takes a while to flip your mindset if you've yeah. got yourself into that mindset of, yeah, covers gigs are crap. 100%, sort of thing. yeah, yeah. I think because I did it from such a young age, I, I just want to carry it on, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I'm, I, I've always said I'm not that bothered if nothing happens. Like, you know, some of these people are obsessed yeah. with it, making sure it happens. Yeah. I'm quite happy with just a nice... Relaxed You're working life. in music, aren't you? Yeah, regardless yeah, of yeah, what happens. Exactly, yeah. It's kind of that point of like when people talk about making it. Where where would you say you're making it is? Have you already made it, or do you think right? I'd just love to be able to play those venues or yeah, do this. What where where's your level of I've made it now? Literally, just as long as I'm doing music and I don't have to do a normal job, I'm pretty happy. I'm yeah. not gonna lie. Yeah, like. I, I think I'm a, a little bit too relaxed about it if that makes sense where you, some people are like really mm. that's a, that's in a way a good thing because you're not putting yourself under yeah, too pressure. much pressure though yeah well people are like you should push yourself more you should you should do it but I'm like as long as I'm I can have quite a happy life just 
gigging and doing like like a, maybe teaching music a few nights a week. I'm quite mm. happy with that. Yeah. So, do you think yeah. that um, the the fact that you're not putting pressure on yourself will help your songwriting as well? Because I imagine if you've got all this pressure, right, I've got to get these songs out and they've got to be at this standard, then maybe that might take away from the quality, maybe yeah. a little bit. Yeah, because you know? you're so relaxed, and like you're not. There's, like I said, there's no pressure, is there, to yeah. make sure that you, you know, I've got this down and this is what they want. And I think that's the thing of like obviously being signed as well. You've got to mm. constantly produce, haven't you? Like yeah. we've said before. Um, but obviously, if something happens, it's just a bonus, isn't it? I think that's sweet. Well, going that's back to that point, like you said about um, where where you see these artists come out and like the the, the next songs always seems to be as good as the yeah. last one. Um, I was recently speaking to Sugar House, and they had they had an artist in that they literally said they had two albums worth of songs, and one album was crap. Wow! No. Like so. The ten, the ten the songs that they ended up going on the album were absolutely fantastic, but the the other ten songs they've recorded them. Yeah. But they're like, yeah, store them away somewhere because they're not they're not good enough at the moment. Yeah. It's so what, if they're if they if they're getting banger after banger after banger, there's probably like we said about four or five songs in between those songs that aren't anywhere yeah. near the level. Yeah. I was thinking, I don't know if it's a good thing to release everything you like straight away no. as well. So like you're releasing an album of ten bangers, that doesn't really make. No. Does that makes sense. Like oh, yeah. you, you look at an album now, it's like there's three or four songs that are like, yes, because they're the yeah. singles, mm. aren't they? And then the rest are just like I call them like album fillers. Yeah, you know definitely. What I mean? It's like some flows of the album as well. Yeah. It's like a, a Palantini's new oh, album. Oh yes. Bit last night in the bittersweet. That's there's so many songs on there that would never be heard on radio. Yeah, they're yeah. still good. Oh, they're still oh, brilliant. So isn't it? Yeah, good, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing as well. Like it, you look well, you look at the bands that do that. And how long do they last? How long can they keep that up for? Yeah. Like, I think I've only just come round to the idea that the Arctic Monkeys had three or four good albums before they completely changed their style to something that didn't suit yeah. them, in my opinion. But, like, the first album literally had 12 bangers. Yeah, I know, yeah. And then I listened to this next one, and I think because Brian Storm got overplayed for, like, <laughs> seven or eight weeks before the album was released, I'd had enough of them. <laughs> um and then I found like some of the album tracks are like, oh, this is a bit gloomy, isn't it? Yeah. Oasis had the same thing. The first two albums was again 12, 12 songs on both albums, fantastic. Yeah. And then they started getting slated after that. Nothing was as good. Nothing yeah. matched it. So do you think that's probably the reason why a load of bands get first album syndrome? Or? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's just like I said. I think it shows the best on it if they can just keep going mm. and just keep. Like, obviously, I don't want to bring him up again, but it's like Ed Sheeran just <laughs> yeah. keeps going, doesn't he? It? It's number ones all the time. It's like, how are you? Yeah, I, just... I think that there is a certain art to that. Like, you've got to realise what's in the market because he's changed his style yeah. to adapt to what yeah. the charts are doing. That's where you've got to give yeah. Ed Sheeran credit. I he knows say what I'm... he's doing, doesn't he? Like, yeah. It's I almost hacking the algorithm, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> not, they've, not, they've not, like, almost been as creative moving forward. Like, if you look at Perfect, it is fairly creative. Like yeah. it's pretty much a four chord, four song. chord song. As every one of his songs is pretty much. <laughs> but but then he'll do stuff like You Need Me in the yeah. first album, and he had that where he sort of went a little bit left field with what he was doing. Yeah. Well, that new album he's just released is it's off his own record and it company. Yeah. So it's very like the first album, uh. and he's pretty much said that he wanted to just release like an acoustic album again. So. That, like, I'm like, oh, this is like Ed Sheeran that I grew up on type Yeah, thing. Mm. that's when I sort of liked him as his first album. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's good that new album. That. So I might have got this completely wrong, but I felt like you got your album recorded at Abbey Road Studios, is that right? Yeah, so we got, I got it done in Manchester, like all recorded, and then I got it mastered. Ah, mastered, Abbey Road, right, okay. Um, but yeah, we got to go and it was like, Amazing. Was that just more for the the visit rather yeah, than? Yeah, yeah. Or was you, there something special that they do with the master? Well, they get you to just sit down and while they're doing it, right? So like they take you through the studio and then like, well, this is the room you're gonna be doing it, and then you sit there for like two hours while he's doing it. So what did they do? Because there's a lot of mastering techniques, and it does make a hell of a difference. What specifically did they do? Because I know they sometimes like record like actually play the track back and then record it through a preamp and stuff like that and it just opens the sound up and you're like what how the hell did that I was just just, honestly that? I, he was just pressing so many buttons <laughs> and I was like what is this guy doing <laughs> but he, he was so good and I, I, I remember I sent it to the guy who recorded it after and he was like yeah you can tell he's done a, a seriously good job mm. um 
but it was just he just made it more warm if that sounds yeah. right yeah obviously louder as well um but yeah it was so cool i remember we opened the doors to walk out and there was all like tourists and they must have thought i was someone famous when i walked out the door yeah Uh, but it was worth it because it was actually cheaper than getting it done online Ah. so we're like i'm in london how much was it sir uh like 350 quid 400 quid quid. right about 100 quid a track something like that um Obviously, I wanted it done there anyway, but mm. I think it, I think it was cheaper than getting it done online right. through them. So yeah, this, it does vary because I I've used a guy called Pete Meyer for mine, right? And he's literally thirty quid for on-site yeah. artists. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's good. He's done he's done like Liam Gallagher, Sam Fender's wow. Lime albums, David Bowie. I'm like, why are you charging thirty quid for my master? <laughs> <laughs> it was so sick in like the room. He had all the plaques of stuff he'd done. Yeah. And he'd done all like I think it was like Lord of the Rings films. Wow. All these these mad films like Harry Potter and stuff like that mm. that he'd mastered. Um, the, I imagine the desk was just bigger oh, than yeah, this yeah, bloody huge. massive. Yeah. And then like the room that he had looked out onto like it was it Studio Two or something like that. So. Was that like a big live room? Like yeah. That? So you, like it was no, you, like the building was there to the right, right of it. It was just like madness. And you could go to the cafe, eat in the cafe and stuff. And um, some of the people I know that have done it, and there's been people there that are like famous and stuff so they spoke to them in the cafe <laughs> it's mental yeah. but anyone that if you if like if you want to do that it's just a mad experience good experience yeah, yeah. yeah. wicked have you ever um, done any gigs say abroad or anything like that no is that uh, no I've just obviously I've done karaoke and oh, okay, yeah, stuff yeah, abroad yeah. Um, I got asked to there's a place we go in Spain and they said would I do the summer there oh that'd be nice I'm fine. No, I don't like the heat that much. I'm no. all right. No, I'm happy in Chorley. Yeah, <laughs> so no, whatever. <laughs> so I just, I don't, I fair play to them people gigging in that yeah, heat every yeah. night. I just could not do that. Yeah. It's bad enough in this I country. Struggled, yeah, I struggled this summer. Yeah. Like, I was having to take a full change of clothes yeah. to gig some weeks. <laughs> it's awful. I, I brought a fan. I was like, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. perfect. You were fancy one of those holiday seasons in nah. like, uh, well, what's it? I've been thinking about like cruise ships, maybe. Oh, all right, yeah. Um, but it's just... That'd be hard, I reckon. Being away from It's every home. night as well, isn't yeah. it? A like, couple let, of times a day. Yeah. It's letting it's letting go of your original music because you know you're not doing oh, yeah, it. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, it'd be on Abba all night. Yeah. <laughs> but you're also travelling the world, aren't you? Yeah, so it's yeah. Like, it's true. There's so many places you want to see and you're doing what you like while also seeing them places. So it's like... It would be a cool thing, I think, but I just need to think about it. But yeah. Take your time. Yeah. But, what, uh, what do you think, again, like... Would you recommend getting a track mastered to anyone? Because I, I think you hear the mix sometimes, and like they do a little bit of a master on it, and yeah. you think, "Wow, that sounds amazing!" But then you hear it on a phone; it's completely different. Yeah. So, what do you think the biggest thing people will get out of mastering is? It's making sure it sounds right on all like systems and platforms. Like I remember they were like, he did this thing where he was listening to it on the computer, listening to it on the speaker, then he put it on like a phone. And it was like, you would just press a button and it, yeah. would, it would move around the systems to make sure it sounded good on everything. Mm. Oh, um, that's cool, yeah. Uh, and the guy in the studio had that as well. Little speaker, his big speakers. So I don't know if you've ever tried to do anything from home or yeah. even with our podcast, you're going to stick it on in the car and there's all these things coming yeah, out of yeah, you. Yeah. Like, I didn't even hear that when it was just yeah. on my phone or on my headphones. Yeah. It's crazy, um, isn't it? So they're, they're like, perfect, like perfectionists, aren't they? Just making mm-hmm. sure it sounds good on everything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 100%. Get, get it mastered wicked wicked yeah. right we're going to take a very short break there and we'll be back for the third and final part um, in a second so uh, cheers Connor nice see, you, see you in a minute thank you hello it's Lee from the One More Song cast the thing you're watching right now sorry if you don't like me that much but I'm here to promote me so on Facebook you can find me at defined by official on Instagram you can find me at defined by the music and on TikTok, you can find me at Defined by Music. I'll be doing a few covers. I release my own original music, so you can hear some of the clips from that. And also, you can find out my up-to-date gigs, so you can come and see me play. I think that's about it. So, we're going back to the episode. Give us a follow. Give us a like. Comment on my stuff. Nice one, so Thanks. Right, we're back for our third and final part with Connor. Um, enjoyed it so far. It's been very insightful, and, and uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about where you go from here now, Connor. Yeah. So, uh, 
what's the plans do you reckon so you're only 21 yeah life ahead of you and it seems like you've uh, put all your eggs in one basket per se yeah uh, um, <laughs> like I said just happy carrying on doing the gigs um, I'd like to get into the teaching side I think okay. a little bit so like I said I picked two teaching modules at uni um, and I've just obviously started that teaching role so yeah I think I think that'd be good and then obviously I mentioned cruise ships as another yeah. option and um, I, I always wanted to do music therapy. Right. But it's another three years at uni. Yeah. Like, so music therapy then, so what's that? Um, so it'd be like going to special needs schools. Oh, right, yeah. Hospitals. It can be prisons and stuff. And just, yeah. But again, it's another three years. Is it like singing, just singing songs or just getting them to explore? Yeah, explore instrument? music. Mm. And obviously, I, 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 I love that type of stuff, especially with children, like special needs children. So especially when my cousin's special needs as well, and I can see the reaction you mm. get from music with them. Um, so I always wanted to do that, but again. Yeah, three years at uni, you can't be bothered with yeah. it. <laughs> what, uh, would you, what would you teach? Guitar, vocal, a bit of uh, it's ev- But you can do everything, yeah, really. Yeah. Um, so, well, someone I went to college has got lucky, and she's just got a job in a special needs school doing it without any like qualification mm. for it, pretty much. So she's been quite lucky. Um but I've, there's a school around near me that have always said I could come in and stuff and just see if I liked it. Um, but yeah, I'll have to see. It's an option, but I was speaking to someone. They did like a, they came into uni, um, the school that did it, and uh, did it, sorry, and they said that um, they want more experience. So they want to wait till you're like 28, 29, right, 30 okay, yeah. before accepting you to do the masters. So. Yeah, so it's a long journey. Sometimes you can, like, I, I go through an agency with the schools and I do it during the week and it is it is great, but you just have to accept, I think, that some kids won't practice yeah. and stuff like that. It is hard to initially to get your head around that. And you're like, what, your mum and dad are paying for lessons you can't be bothered picking up your yeah. guitar in a week. And But, they, like, kids do everything, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah I, I remember doing them. <laughs> guitar lessons in school as well they're good um, but yeah you could tell the people that weren't that bothered if it was maybe their parents kind of pushing it on them um, but yeah it's another option that I'm thinking about but again I think I think it's something that I'd wait till I'm a little bit older with if I did do it so um, yeah is there plenty of venues that you still play at now that you did from the very start yeah. like more like covers I know obviously you've been to like Red Lion Longton I know I, that was one of my very first venues and I know like Maureen and people like that yeah, know Maureen, you quite yeah. well um, do, do you still find you playing at the same venues from the very start yeah some of them yeah like Molten Hops in Chorley yeah, yeah. that's one of my favourites I had my first one there actually it was great weren't yeah, it they pop so a good. listen there don't they yeah yeah he's like yeah, really intense yeah. and he makes sure everyone like pays attention yeah uh, that's Defo One Red Lion. I've played there since yeah. I was young. I think we're in Penwitham that I've done since. It's a big place I played in yeah. Penwitham. Uh, around Chorley, I've not played in Chorley for a while. Have you not? No. No. But again, like we mentioned, Rose and Crown. I've played there since I was young. Um, but yeah, just it's good to go back and you're like, oh, I played it when I was. Because mm. then they remember. I remember when you <laughs> twelve or thirteen. You become one of the locals almost. <laughs> yeah. Don't you? yeah. Um, but yeah, it's good. That's I'd say that's one of my favourites. Molten hops. Yeah, it's good. Hundred yeah. percent. I'm in there in a few weeks. I think so. Wicked. Yeah. yeah so great. what venues have you got aspirations to play at, particularly with your original? Music? Oh, if I was picking one, uh, Royal Albert Hall that is the number one. I've yeah. always wanted to play. We did a, a, a tour of it about two years ago. <laughs> I saw a gig there um, would have nearly been 10 years ago now or maybe it would have been 10 years ago now it's flawless acoustically it's insane isn't it absolutely flawless he was on about it the guy like so we did the tour I and mean, we were the only people on it I was like right it's amazing <laughs> private tour and he was just telling us about the, the stuff they've got in the ceilings just to the sound to make it sound better for everybody no matter where you sat really um, so yeah that, that'd be number one I'd say I've always wanted to play Madison Square Garden as well Big dreams. So. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's yeah. an aspiration and a half. Yeah. yeah, it does look good, and they they do every event there, don't they? As yeah. well, I remember like being mad and at the time it was WWF. Oh, as a kid. same. Yeah, I was mad like, at that. Used to see WrestleMania <laughs> yeah. from Madison Square Gardens with Hulk Hogan versus Bret Hart and all yeah. that. Like, I was like, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I did the X Factor, I got to sing at Wembley. That was pretty cool. All right. So that's one kind of ticked off. Even though it's not my own stuff, I was like, I sang there. 
What, like in Wembley Stadium? Yeah, n- the Wembley Arena, you know, oh, the, one, the one next course, to it. Yeah, yeah. So they like they, they had that and there was like 10,000 people there or something wow. like that. Wicked. So, you've also got the pressure of these four people looking at you. There's also <laughs> 10,000 behind them. So it wasn't like usually where they just have you in a room with just them. It was a massive crowd. I was like, and I was first on as well. I think it was my age, they couldn't keep me there for more than a few hours or something. Wow. Uh, so I was first on. I was like, right. Was it quite early in the morning as well? Yeah. How did your voice feel at that well, time in the morning? We had to be there for like 6 a.m. Do loads of interviews. I think I must have been on about 9 or 10 or something like that. Because <laughs> they do it in sections, I think. So like there's a morning section, they let the judges have a break, then there's an afternoon, then an evening. But you could, some people can be singing at like midnight. Wow. Yeah. So I was very lucky that we didn't have to get there from 6 and wait till late at night. Mm. But... Nice. So you, you said about how you sometimes struggle with the interaction at gigs and, and sort of that audience. Uh, have you found that's got better as you've you've started to do the original gigs and yeah. you're almost having to sell your music and your personality and yeah, I'd everything? Yeah, I'd say with my own gigs, I'm quite good at it. Right. I don't know if there's more people on stage and like, yeah. it's my music, so I don't have to, I can tell a story, if you know what I mean, before a song. Um, but yeah, I, I get into it a lot more if it's my own gig. Um I, my mum says you can always tell when I'm enjoying it. Like, yeah. uh, I just, oh, I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I'm better at speaking to an audience now. It's just maybe I look a bit chilled out maybe when I'm singing. But definitely with them original gigs, I'm like, I what, love it. What do you think is, what do you think you do find hardest with talking to a crowd? What do you think is that makes it so difficult? Because I've, I've always kind of struggled with that bit as well. Mm. So yeah, it'd be interesting to hear it from your perspective. I think it's just like, oh, do they just want to hear the songs that they actually <laughs> yeah. bothered what I'm saying? <laughs> and you don't want to like speak for too long. And then you don't want to repeat, you constantly repeat the same thing. This is this song, this is that. Yeah. Oh, thank you, cheers. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so it's finding things to say. I, I, with some songs now, I have like little stories that I just repeat. Yeah. Like, this is where I first heard this song, and that's why I learned it. This is why I did that. And um, so, yeah, like that, but it's just. Have you ever gone to. I do this all the time where you go to say something and then sort of realize that you're not going anywhere with what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. you're like, it's right, so I've got to start the next song. Yeah, <laughs> yeah know, I've so done like, that before, but yeah, it's, it's just. It's, I, I've always just like, just, just sing and just not speak too much, but. <laughs> You watch some gigs now where you go and like proper acts and they, they just don't speak at all. They yeah, just, no. just plough straight through, don't they? Yeah. I watched Fall Out Boy and um, they didn't talk, they didn't really talk to the crowd. I think the bass player just did everyone all right and he came on in an England <laughs> shirt or something yeah. like that. <laughs> I love like, it. it. Yeah, I love it when they just start straight away and don't say anything yeah. before the gig, if you know what I mean. Yeah, like two or three songs yeah. in, like and then if they've speak. not acknowledged the crowd. Like at Arctic Monkeys, it was literally like, because he's got that half. LA sort of accent now it's hello Manchester yeah <laughs> like, what are you doing like just talk normally <laughs> so how are you finding now balancing those original gigs I know you said you were finding it maybe difficult doing the the full your night kind of thing and you were going to do a lo- little bit more support gigs yeah you talk us through that a little bit so yeah I, I've just you've obviously got the pressure on you haven't you to sell tickets wherever you know if you're doing a support it may be with a bigger act where they know they can bring in people because they're well liked for their own music um, especially when you're booking these big venues you don't want to have to cancel on people and stuff like that if you don't sell enough tickets so that's I'd say that's where the pressure is maybe like like when you're starting your own stuff for support it's better I'd yeah. say um, I think if I've done yeah I did I did one support I supported the Shambolics they're from Scotland way but they're getting quite okay, decent yeah, big yeah. now yeah I've heard of them yeah um, so I did them at the ferret with them um, just trying to get more but it's it's difficult yeah especially if you're trying to get into a new area as well like all these acts playing in Manchester and Liverpool aren't they it's like well I've never heard of you in Manchester and Liverpool mm. Yeah. Um, do you get a bit of that then if you imagine you have to approach the original yeah. venues a bit more yeah so that I have I remember when I got proper like obsessed with it last year of trying to get stuff it was also you got to go to the promoter if you got or you've got to go to the act the venue could never do anything about it right um, so I've but the, it's them getting back to you that's difficult as yeah. well and then it's like the, there's something called this feeling in Manchester I don't yeah. Know, yeah so then you get a gig with them it's like the pressure to sell tickets in Manchester because you've got to sell tickets for mm. that. Um, so obviously then these bands that are, go to uni in Manchester but live in 
I can like they know everybody, don't they? So yeah. it's like, whereas I don't live in, so um, trying to get people to a gig, a gig sure, in yeah. a different, yeah, it's difficult. So that's why I'd be better of ones where you know the act have sold all the tickets and you can just rock up, but it's hard getting gigs like that. Um, so that's really difficult when you're not yeah. predominantly from that area yeah. to, to get people to listen to. That's why it's good if you can find someone that would just kind of take you under <laughs> your yeah, wing yeah, and just yeah. be like, yeah. Um, yeah, let's go, that type thing. I'll try and get your name out there in different cities. Um, but yeah, it's difficult. Have you got management or looked into it at the moment? No. Nah, I think it's something I need to probably look at, but it's finding the right person in it that's yeah. going to be interested in you enough. Actually, yeah, probably like... The way I've been spoken to about management, you're better off getting someone that'll just work and earn his money off the back of your ticket sales yeah. because then there's an incentive for it from him yeah. or for him to push you a little bit harder. But yeah. it's all the stuff that comes with it. It's just another face to have input that maybe isn't a musician and stuff yeah. like that that you're worried about. Yeah, it's difficult. And like I said, it's hard finding one that you're happy with. And yeah, um, But yeah, we'll just have to see. I think it's a thing like you've got to approach them as well a little mm. bit or they've got to see you whereas how do you find that then because I've got quite used to with uh, covers gigs people just approaching you all the time yeah. and, and you, you get a little bit of pride from that don't you yeah, it's like yeah. oh I've got all these inquiries whereas I imagine that's a completely different experience in the original world where you feel like you're chasing maybe that takes yeah, a hit on your ego you, a little bit that's what I'm saying you've got a con with the original music it's all about how much you want to put into it I yeah. think. whereas covers gigs you can just yeah let people approach you whereas that it's it's how much you push in social media side as well that's massive like yeah. how do you find that because some people really don't enjoy that experience no, I hard don't, work I don't enjoy it I, I, I don't enjoy the social media it's like constantly just it's one of them I do and I don't like some of it's quite fun like yeah. when you're actually making the content or whatever but then there's other times where you're just like oh this is a full time job in yeah. itself mm. Yeah. You're like, I wish I could just afford to pay someone to do it. And yeah. like, I think the the other thing is with the with the covers. I think someone recently said it to me that the gig is the advert. Yeah, you, know, you, you see me set, you see how I gig. Come and watch me. Yeah. That's that's basically 100%. how you do it, really. Mm. That's why I started off when I started just doing loads of free stuff. It was like it's free advertisement, basically, wasn't it? And mm. then now I do, that's fine now because people remember that, and then I've got gigs from that, but. If you, the amount of times you know you do a wedding or a party, yeah, and you get like three or four bookings mm. just from that wedding, because there's other people there mm. that are going to get married, isn't there? So that's yeah. what you kind of yeah. seeing it as. Or have birthdays, yeah. or whatever. Do you feel that that works in the original scene where you're seen at a, an original venue, and then you feel like you maybe get other original venues off the back of that? Is right, it, it's just, just to, it's totally like, different. Yeah. Like, it depends on the promoter. Yeah, I think. obviously, because I've not done anything with a promoter, maybe, um, but it's like that venue will just say do you want to come back mm. it's like well, can I it's hard selling tickets for the same venue I, I, I think especially if like well let's do it again in a few months time yeah whereas in a pub you can just go back can't you because yeah. there might be different people but with that original stuff it's like I'd rather change the venue or not do too many if I can where where it's me selling tickets if it's someone else I'll, yeah. I'm not not that fussed but I try and spread them out like when was the last one? April. So April to October for a big gig, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, it's tough. Good. Very, Very tough. What's yeah. the best gig you've had so far? It could be covers or original, whatever um, you think has stood out to you as that was a great night. Sometimes when you least expect it as well. Yeah. God. Bit of pressure there. Yeah. <laughs> either, either Chorley Theatre or a Conti for my own stuff. Yeah. And then, so did they go exactly to plan? Everyone really engaged. Yeah, pretty, it was just yeah, perfect nights. Much. It was good. Yeah, can't really, I was really nervous because I'd never played with these musicians mm. before. Right, not even in a practice. Well, yeah, we practiced like yeah. twice, but okay. it was like, you know, live's different. Isn't like, it? Yeah. Live oh, is yeah, different because you don't know how they're going to react. Yeah. Yeah. they they're probably nervous <laughs> or as nervous as you are because they're feeling the pressure of getting your songs right. Yeah, it was obviously when I asked them, I don't think they expected that it would be in front of that many people for the first right. one, because that was the first one yeah. as well. I think they were just expecting like a little support gig or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's just, obviously because I'm on my own, I, I know if I make a mistake, whereas yeah. kind of trust these people yeah, around me to, true, true. to 
get it. No spot. mistakes then. It, all it was pretty yeah, much yeah, spot on. Care, so that's good. Right. It's yeah. handing over that responsibility to the other musicians as well. <laughs> like, right, we've done everything we can. Like, it's now over to us as a unit yeah. like so you've not only got to think about that but you're also relying on them to get that yeah. part right and it's just... I think the only thing that went wrong was he snapped his guitar string in the oh. last song <laughs> well it's not too bad on last it's one, the last it? one that he didn't bring us back so it <laughs> pretty much knackered because he was trekking he couldn't drive or he didn't have his car up at that point so he was getting the train from Manchester just so like amp uh, pedal board guitar he's like I can't bring another guitar especially getting the train laid back yeah um but yeah, they're all they're all so good musicians. So, um, I trust them <laughs> now <laughs> to, to be good. I imagine you've met plenty of um, good musicians at uni as well. Yeah, yeah. Has that been where you've been able to network the best? In yeah, terms well, of music? obviously he. I think he's the the best in terms the guitarist mm. in terms of like musicians. Ridiculous! Like he doesn't need to practice. Right. <laughs> if you just send him a song in the key, he'll just play it. It's like. Wow, <laughs> he plays everything as well, like bass, guitar, producers. And it's just, he's just a whiz with like theory as well. Just yeah, it mad. just makes a difference when you just know someone that locks in and goes right. Okay, it's in this key. I'll just use that shape. Yeah, and they just always seem to find the right part. Yeah, like I think the yeah when I'm working with the producers, they sometimes go right. Just give us that guitar a minute. Right, just play that chorus. And they'll just put in something. And you're like, wow. How the yeah. hell did you hear that? Like, what what on earth inspires him to do it? It's mm. just ridiculous. I think theory helps a lot with that. Mm. Obviously, I don't know that much, but... He, do you try and work on your theory side? No. Nah, I've tried. We but... don't do it in uni, so... Yeah, yeah, the college, they were big on it. Mm. Like, we, we had loads of lessons on it and assignments, but I've not done it in uni. You can pick it as a module, but yeah. I wouldn't put myself <laughs> through that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's hard, because I, I, my first instrument was piano. Yeah. So I knew like a bit how to read music, but I was never really given the understanding how to apply it. So st I still sometimes struggle with that. Like yeah. I know what came playing in, but like to find the shape, remember the shapes on guitar and actually transport their trans, transfer it into playing. Yeah. It's it's another game in itself. Yeah, yeah. Like to mentally go right, okay, it's in this key. I need to use these five shapes. Done. Yeah. Like I don't know how people do it. <laughs> That's what they've helped with a lot as well. Uni and college, like. I feel like my guitar's got better, like different shapes and stuff, mm. just from going there. Not even like practicing it with them, just no. like, just being yeah. around other people. You know what I mean? All oh, right, so you're playing that G chord, right? Just put it, put it up here and play it with a cap. Yeah, just, yeah, like just stuff like that. Just little things that you mm. wouldn't, you wouldn't think about in your head, but you kind of know you have picked up if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um. So yeah, definitely that. <laughs> but yeah, they're just, it's great to play with other musicians that are kind of like it as well do you know what i mean they all they all say it as well like we really like like playing as well so it's great can't beat it really yeah i've always found it quite it's when you're maybe not at uni you're not all there for the same thing a lot of musicians are quite because obviously everyone's got their own ambitions yeah. their own so it's quite hard to actually collectively get a group together but yeah. i imagine that's a little bit easier at uni because you're kind of all there for the same thing yeah yeah 100 um, yeah wicked. Um, but yeah it's good, good experience in terms. I like the performance type lessons. I don't, I don't really like sitting there, like listening to tutors. I'd rather just be playing, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But you've got to do that bit as well. Um, but yeah, when you, cause like, I remember in college, they each week one person would like perform a song, and they'd bring in like a house band. So these musicians right. were like ridiculously good, and you'd be get to sing your song and hear it with. Like amazing band. so that that inspired you as well to keep writing because you're like well these people could be playing for me do you know what i mean mm. um and they were just amazing like again people that just pick it up they'd never heard the song before and you'd go in and you'd have like two hours while all the other students watched and picked apart bits and said what you should be doing there um and then yeah that was it but and then you perform the song after and get it like recorded pretty cool i wish they still did that i think they should do that in the uni as well but they mm. don't um but yeah it's brilliant that lesson i used to love that <laughs> so do you attend all like the master classes and all that yeah sort of i try to but it's difficult because sometimes they can be like late at night or when i have a lesson and it's then if i have a lesson at 9 a.m i'm waiting around till four or five o'clock in the afternoon and it, that's difficult i think that's what helps if you live in because you can just yeah. go back to your flat wait and then go back mm. um but i've been to a few um like they had a social media one i went to that a few managers have been in and stuff um 
the London ones seem to get the better ones, I'd say. I've had Stormzy, Brian May, just like shit like that. I was like, <laughs> why are we not having that? Yeah. Um, why is it not Gallagher coming yeah, for a second? Yeah, like. but it, they, they do get some good ones, interesting stuff. Um, that's where they had that music therapy one as well. I went to that. Um, it's just finding ones you're interested in as well. But yeah, it's good. Good. So you say you're not often practicing guitar anymore, like we all kind of, you get to a standard and then you kind of let the gig and do the talking. Yeah. Um, are you constantly coming up with song ideas though and are you constantly sort of writing and yeah so if i get a bit of time off i will set the stuff up in the room and yeah. learn a few new songs so I did that over christmas and but writing songs i feel like you just got you got to like i don't know do you feel it comes to you or yeah. do you have to sit down and yeah, go I, right today i'm gonna i, I can't do that no, if, if i said to you now i'm gonna go home and write a song i couldn't no it just yeah. has to, like it's weird like i'll i'll not think about writing a song and I'll do it and then like I'll write like three or four in that space yeah. and then I'll leave it for a little bit mm. I've done that so many times where I've like wrote two songs or three and I'm just like yeah they're all pretty good and then not right for like two three months yeah you're like if the inspiration's not there like there's some people that will go I try and write every day yeah that's like much. and you, they probably come out with some crap yeah. and like they know they're coming out with crap at times but they've just got to get that out of the system and keep in the habit because they know what works for them yeah I, do, I don't think i could do that i think i'd do the same as you like yeah. write three or four in a space of a month and then not write for a year yeah literally, that's literally, <laughs> just, honestly that's what i do and i wish i could just sit down but i think again because i've said perfectionist i don't want to write a bad one if you know what i mean <laughs> i think that's it as well mm. and i don't get these people that like can you know, go in a studio for two weeks and write an album. I think that is mental. Yeah, Obviously, exactly. loads of bands do that, but yeah, it's like the pre-production bit, yeah. isn't it? Like they'll go in, like listen to the songs, and then they'll go right. Well, we'll get ideas from that for the actual yeah. album, and you're like, what? And again, you sat and watch that Beatles. Um, no, I've not watched thing. it that's, yet. That's a bit no, nice, I should watch it to be fair. They just come up with like they just sit in a room for Literally. two weeks. Like, yeah, it's mad. And again, then we talk about pressure as well. That's pressure yeah, again, yeah. knowing that you've got that booked. Yeah. knowing that you've got to write them songs in that time smart smart um, um, so you say you struggle to write lyrics yeah. um, does that mean sometimes you struggle to connect with your own songs in the way of obviously talking about a love a love yeah. or whatever it is do yeah. you struggle with sort of that side of things if that makes um, sense where do your ideas come from lyrically when you do write the lyrics usually and that's usually it, it was it about like love type sh stuff but I think because I've been in a relationship like four or five years now it's yeah it's difficult to write those type <laughs> of songs isn't it um but whereas now the there's a light was about like lockdown and getting out of it and like hopefully everything will be all right type of thing yeah um so now I, I, my writing just has changed a lot from that type of like lovey type song to like more actual meaning mm. i don't because i'm getting older i like <laughs> Yeah, I think sometimes you just that if you have the radio on in the car, like something annoys you, and that sparks an idea. Yeah, like like <laughs> if you, writing when you're pissed off is probably better than writing when you're sad. Yeah, <laughs> because you get a more energetic tune out of it. Yeah, but, the amount of like voice notes I've got in that phone right, with like yeah. incomplete stuff. Yeah, watch one line is pretty. <laughs> It's kind of sad. I should probably <laughs> finish them all. Do you ever go back to the voice notes? Like, <laughs> yeah. What the fuck is this? I've like? actually got voice notes of like "There's a Light" and "Promise" of like when I first. Uh, yeah. it, and it's like, oh, that sounds very different. Yeah. But yeah, I it's think weird. that's a weird thing. Like sometimes like, the worst bit is when you like sort of going to record a cover or going to record a version to put on social media, and that thing flashes up storage full. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Then you're like, oh, Google Drive this shit. <laughs> <laughs> My log I've got so many like logic recordings where it's like it's like a bit like you need to put it on a hard drive now, I think, yeah. because mm. it's taking too much space on yeah, the computer. Yeah. It gets scary that one. <laughs> Especially if you put so many plugins on like mm. Oh my word. Yeah. It, it's, Putting yeah. one plugin on just jumps it like by a like a full ter yeah. like full megabyte, yeah, sorry. Literally. Yeah. Some of the ones I've got as well, like quite high gigabytes so oh. putting them on and then changing all the shit and it's like the computer's like no stop <laughs> like the bit where logic keeps going system on the system yeah. off <laughs> worst gig story Connor or like weirdest moment at a gig or you know something that just stands out in that sense I've got one recently actually on. I did um, I got asked to do Victoria's Festival in Portsmouth oh, okay. That's like in quite, Portsmouth yeah so because right, okay. I'm, I'm from there obviously yeah. I, I, thought, I thought I'd do it um, like a big festival like Mumford and Sons were headlining oh, so nice. I was like I was a little bit nervous and I, I was on the stage I was in my second song and the power just went 
Oh. And the sound, I could see the sound guy panicking. I was like, I've got quite a big crowd here. Oh. Let's, and I saw people slowly walking away oh, as no. the sound went. I was like, shit. And That's why you're talking to the crowd skills. Yeah. And then I, was, I couldn't because there was no like, oh, yeah. microphone. <laughs> I was like, please, please stay. <laughs> and then he, he was like, and then he told me after he got it going, like like a minute or so after, and then people started coming like, back. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, the battery powered the generators. I was like, right, nice. <laughs> he said it happened yesterday as well. I was like, he was like, the budget's not enough for this stage. We should have a bigger PA as right. well. And I was what do like, you do then? Just stand there? No, well, there's nothing. I, yeah. I couldn't do anything. I was like, I obviously went to see if it was all right. And he, he got it back on quite quickly. <laughs> I was like, I was just telling people, like, well, it's not me. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but it was quite like an intimate, nice stage. But it was as the entrance of people walked in and there's a showcase stage right there. So people heard something they liked, they'd stay. And then obviously that happened, so... <laughs> I was, I was so stressed. Oh. Uh, right, we've only got a couple of minutes, and t- we might we could do an extra little bit at the end. But um, so, what? Who would you recommend? Maybe more as an original artist, but it doesn't have to be. Who would you recommend as an act, or it could be solo band to go and watch? Yeah, to go go maybe check out. Can they be big as well? Or it'd be nice if they were more local. But yeah, uh, if- I was talking to you before about there's a lad from Oxford, Isaac Stewart. Okay. Oh, I think he's pretty decent. And what sort of genre is he? Uh, it's a bit like Tom O'Dell. Okay. Right. Like right. piano, like really, uh, really yeah, good yeah. on piano as well. Um, he's very good. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I like that's quite small. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? <laughs> I mentioned before Seamus, he's amazing. Yeah. You can go and watch him around yeah, here. Yeah, he's play, playing around here um, pretty regularly. Um, but yeah, them, nice. them two, I'm quite, obviously big inspiration I think because he's similar age as well at Isaac Stewart so it's kind of nice watching someone yeah. um, but he's doing I think he's touring Manchester and stuff and London so he's, he's doing alright cool we'll pop some of his links down in the yeah. in the bio um, so going forward then Connor um, what, what would you recommend for somebody starting out it could be in the cover scene it could be as an original but they may be starting out from a young age like you did what advice would you give them to getting going uh, just putting yourself out there as much as possible, I'd say. Yeah. Um, just not being afraid. You see so many people that have got like decent voices, and they're just like, no, I don't want to do it live. Like, you can't. You need to if you want to do something. But like I said, the live events, you start it now, just do them because there's like forty five minutes in. It's not like you're getting paid to do a pub. It's like there's not. Obviously, there is a bit of pressure, but it's more relaxed. So that advice is probably pretty. Decent yeah, yeah. to do live events. Did you yeah. ever do any open mics at the start either? Or was uh, it mainly no, I've just never really done events? open yeah. mics. The only time yeah. I remember doing an open mic is it was in Chorley and I just started with a drummer. So we had a gig at the weekend and we just wanted to make sure that yeah. we uh, sounded all right in front of an audience. So we did that. Um, and another good thing as well, open mics, yeah, if you're just starting. Um, but yeah, probably then kind of three things. Wicked. Where can we find you, Connor, on social media and how can we find your music? Uh, just Spotify, Apple Music, Connor Banks, and then just all the social medias, Connor Banks Music, pretty much. Cool. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Thanks for coming on today, Connor. Thank really you much appreciate it. Me. And thank uh, you. hopefully you make it in time for your uni today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah, good man. Cheers. Go and check Connor out on all the social media platforms and uh, we'll see you for the next one. Cheers. <laughs>